Martin. We're glad to be here with you. I'm a researcher here at the University of Divinity. Um, we have some wonderful speakers for you today. Everyone you will hear from has been involved with some discussions this morning uh, held in partnership with the Indigenous Knowledge Institute at the University of Melbourne. And I'm sure some of the themes of those discussions will come through in what is presented. One of those themes has to do with the ways we listen to story and to one another and how our communities are shaped by the ways that we listen. And with that in mind, I'd like to invite Sarah Bacala, also from the University of Divinity, to bring an acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Sam, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this afternoon, we join together from diverse locations, brought together in a moment of connection. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, traditional custodians of the land now also known as Melbourne, and also the Bunurong or Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, traditional owners of the land from which I speak to you down on Western Port Bay. Together, all of us, we take this moment to recognise the stewardship of these lands by generation upon generation upon generation. And we offer our respect to leaders past, present and emerging. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I wanted to be able to introduce you today to Daniel Wilfred, a Yungle ceremonial leader of the Wagalak clan, an artist with the Australian Art Orchestra. Unfortunately, uh, we had some travel problems late last night and he's unable to make it. Um, Daniel, I've got a short video anyway, um, but Daniel has been involved in performing at major festivals, including the London Jazz Festival and the Melbourne International Arts Festival and conducted workshops at Cambridge University and the Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts. And in 2009, Daniel was the recipient of a Northern Territory Government Arts Fellowship. He is an investigator on a University of Divinity research project on collaborative theology and Jungle epistemology. Daniel's created a short video to welcome us today, um, and I'll share that with you now. Hello, student. We want to welcome you with the song called Rocky, playing with didgeridoo and clapping stick. So this song now we're gonna sing about hope you land and keep you feel it inside to your heart and keep learning more new things. This is a rocky now. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Daniel and David Wilfred from Mukur in the Northern Territory. For many years, uh, this song, Rocky String, has been the impetus behind my research and teaching with Daniel. And I'd like to reflect a little on Rocky as it shapes some of our discussions today. Rocky is about passing songs and narratives down the generations. Like many fibers that interweave to form a length of string, Rocky connects many different generations together. It stretches backwards and forwards. Rocky is also woven into string bags formed by knotting together many different strands, creating many points of connection. At these nodes, the string lines of different narratives and histories converge and diverge. Today, our discussions bring together Yungu, Wolpri, Ariyamatna, Chaloi, Kabi Kabi, and Wiradjuri string lines, among others. Our differences allow unique identities to be affirmed, even as new connections emerge. My conversations with Daniel have recently turned to what it means to listen to one another. Yungu and Balanda, songman and researcher, one who reads the country, the other who reads Wittgenstein. This is the concept of Raipiri. Daniel tells me that we are not trying to build a bridge. Through our research and teaching, we are not constructing a mechanism to get from one culture or set of experiences to another. Rather, in the way we sit together, in who we are, we are being formed by one another. Another way of putting it is this, our most important work has always been done while fishing. I mean this literally and metaphorically because Rucky is also fishing line. As we sit together chatting on a dusty riverbank, making tea, casting our lines into the water, identity and community are being formed. Here, we are the same but different. Sitting on the same ground, yet casting a line that extends from such different cultures and histories. In our proximity, fishing lines tangle and we laugh, laughter made possible by our differences. 
Rucky is about the gift of relationships. This can challenge us in ways we think about theology and Christian faith. Rucky shows us how to sit together, to attend to a song that resonates deeply with who we are, while drawing us toward a fuller realisation of who we are. We're going to be sharing more about Rucky, and you can hear Daniel share about that tomorrow morning as this uh, story underpins collaboration and creativity. But you'll have to tune into our panel, part of a discussion from 11 o'clock, and that's a symposium titled Cooking the Kangaroo. And I'll post a link to that in the chat section if you'd like to register for that. But now I'd like to hand over to Peter Sherlock. Professor Peter Sherlock is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Divinity and an international expert on the cultural history of Renaissance and Reformation Europe, especially the commemoration of the dead and cultures of remembering and forgetting in human societies. Peter, I'm looking very much forward to what you've got to share with us today. Um, so over to you. Great, thanks very much, Sam, and greetings, everyone. Um, you may wonder what is a cultural historian of the Reformation, the Renaissance, doing opening a seminar um, on the concept of Rocky and conversations about Indigenous theologies. So I thought I'd start with, in the spirit of relationship, of telling a couple of stories uh, about myself. Um, my family, um, through my father's line, has been involved in Western theological education and intellectual tradition for about 220 years in a variety of formats. Um, its origins are in England in the creation of the Sunday school movement in the Methodist church and the belief that uh, teaching people to read would mean they could read the Bible and figure out what it means for themselves. So that's one thread that comes down to me. Um, another one is my great, great, great grandfather, I think he's right, who was the principal of New College in London uh, in the mid to late 19th century and was engaged in the work of biblical translation uh, of the Bible into modern English, um, modern English being the late 19th century version rather than the early 17th century English version that that society had inherited. Again, on the belief that it was important that we tried together to understand what it is that the Bible actually says. So that's come down to me as well. And of course, some of you would know my dad um, who was, uh, in, has been engaged in theological education for most of his life. Um, both in that so-called Berlin tradition of intellectual formation, theology is a critical practice uh, in the Western philosophical tradition, but also in that Athens aspect of it, uh, that notion of theology as character formation, where you, you take everything you believe apart again at theological college, you put it all back together, and you might be ready for some form of vaguely self-aware ministry as a result. So that, that comes to me as well. That's a, a little bit of some of my personal story, but there's also a professional story um, I wanted to share. So the university of which I'm now vice chancellor was established in 1910 with the Melbourne College of Divinity. And its purpose back then was to, was a nationalist one, part of the Australian white nationalist project, which was to say post federation, there ought to be an Australian based institution that could offer Australian theology degrees for people preparing for ministry in this land. And of course, implicitly that was for um, people who were invaders and settlers, uh, not for indigenous people. And the first executive officer of the old MCD back in 1910 was its registrar. It was a guy called John Matthew. And his job for the next 10 years was to set the exam papers and make sure they got marked with all the quality and standards. And it was a pretty standard set of examination topics around Bible theology, and so on and it even included a comparative religion paper but there was nothing anywhere in the curriculum that acknowledged that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples might have anything to say about theology or spirituality and you might say well that's no surprise but it is a surprise um, because John Matthew way back then in 1910 was a self-taught anthropologist of, of a kind who was writing books about Aboriginal culture, society and religion from the 1890s through the 1900s. And in fact, he even gained the degree of Doctor of Divinity from this institution uh, for his published work on Aboriginal societies. 
I wouldn't recommend that you read it. Um, a lot of it's pretty offensive now and it's well out of date. But the point I wanna make professionally is that in this institution, right back at its foundation, we had someone who considered themselves an expert on indigenous societies and religions who took no step whatsoever to connect that to the fundamental, fundamental work of institu this institution in theological education. So I bring that story before you as a huge disconnect um, that I think sits at the heart of much of what has happened in Australian theological education uh, over the last 200 years and more. So I wanna make some very brief remarks uh, today about uh, what theology is and where in particular the project of the University of Divinity's engagement with indigenous theologies might be going. So I think at its best, theology, Christian theology is an, is an attempt to apprehend fundamental truths and to examine their implications for how we live together in creation. In traditional Western Christian theology, this means understanding sin. What does it mean to be in wrong relationship? How do we understand our brokenness, our betrayal, our disobedience? And it means understanding grace, the gift of being brought into right relationship, even despite our actions and our flaws. So in other words, theology's purpose at a fundamental level is to discern how things really are. This has made theology incredibly powerful. Its ability to hurt is as great as its capacity to heal. And this is seen in everything from evangelistic justifications for colonization that has led us to this place in this land at this time, to the sexual abuse of children by clergy and church workers. It's done an immense harm in our society. But it's also seen in the healing ways in which theological ideas and concepts have empowered the disfranchised and driven dispossessed people to call for justice, many cases successfully. It's that prophetic imagination, that proclamation of the good news that speaks to justice for all and can lead societies to extraordinary levels of change. In this land, since at least the 1850s, theology in its formal sense has largely been taught through church-based colleges. As many of you will know, it's been excluded from most public universities from 1850 onwards because it's been seen as suspect academically and as sectarian. Much of Australian theological education has focused on those poles I mentioned of the Athens and Berlin concept the character formation for ministry, the intellectual engagement with a substantive discipline. But until recently, there's been little attention to what we might term something like Uluru theology, a wholly different pole of thinking about uh, theology, about God, about our relationships with creation and with each other. And that's notwithstanding many attempts by Western theologians to engage with Indigenous communities, even by living alongside them, by learning language and culture. It's notwithstanding the development of vital institutions such as Mangalinya College or Wuntu Pavoya to provide for education directly in Indigenous community contexts. And I think this is because theological education in Australia continues to struggle with the fundamental question of context. Can theology be authentically practised here or is it just part of the overall structure of European invasion? And of course, the question I want to come back to is, who is the student or teacher or practitioner of theology and how do they gain recognition in a system which is primarily predicated on Western academic credentials, including things as the ability to learn ancient Greek in English language contexts. The University of Divinity was born out of this context as indicated in 1910, out of that nationalist desire for Australian degrees for Australian clergy. And it's become many different things over time. Since the 1970s, there's been a particular focus on collaborative theological education that acknowledges difference reaching out across the churches, seen most notably next year in, in 2022, when we'll celebrate 50 years since the Roman Catholic Church joined the previously entirely Protestant Melbourne College of Divinity. In the last few years, we've, we've spoken a lot about uh, the project of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this land in theological terms. But I've worried at many times, and, and many friends have reminded me of this, that we, we do that at risk of speaking about cheap reconciliation, um, reconciliation that doesn't start with the primary product of right relationship, of addressing questions of justice and truth. 
um, as several people have reminded me, it's very hard to have reconciliation in this country, theologically or otherwise, when there actually hasn't been any conciliation or treaty making in the first place. So where does this leave us in, 2012, in 2021 um, as the University of Divinity? Well, we've just taken the first steps now with the new School of Indigenous Studies, which will be formally launched on Monday. Um, that creates one space that is intended to be a safe space for Indigenous people to study, live, work, write, do research uh, and be employed um, to create an opportunity to build partnerships with community and elders. And of course, it's not the only space. Um, there's our four to five year old relationship with NATES as an international Indigenous community that's with emerging roots in this country um, that provides postgraduate opportunities and research opportunities for Indigenous people to study theology and indeed to transform theology. There's the conversation that Sam has helped put together today um, about further partnerships and, and opportunities um, for us to rethink what it means to do theology. The theme that's come out of all of these partnerships and emerging relationships for me is the, is the theme which will be at the heart of the School of Indigenous Studies, and that is the decolonization of theology. So what might decolonization of theology look like? Well, it's got to mean more than exploring or taking an adventure into Indigenous theology. Those, those language terms themselves um, indicate the potential for recolonization in this area if we're not careful. We can't just explore or adventure into. It can't be a repossession of Indigenous knowledge. Instead, it's got to involve a turning to different ways of learning, different pedagogies, different axiologies, different ways of knowing and of authenticating. It's got to begin from humility. And of course, humility is the best possible posture from which to start any theological inquiry that's engaged in the search for truth in a search for understanding the way things actually are. I think part of the project of decolonizing of theology has to ask the question, can such a project have within it ingredients for redemption, uh, for justice, for all of the peoples of this ancient land? Decolonizing theology, of course, also has to recognize that our scriptures and traditions aren't really ours at all, but they're a gift. Um, in Christian theology, a gift from God that emerged through people in another colonised land in another time and place. So the question I'm encouraging us to ask in the university, and I hope will flow into some of the conversations that follow today, is to think through what is the task for theologians in this land, the task that is authentic to this time and place, the task that speaks to justice and to truth. And second, the challenge in that is to ask indeed, who are our theologians in this time and place and how might their voices be heard? Suggesting perhaps that theologians within the universities and colleges that we have are one voice, uh, but there are many others beside, and I know we're going to hear from some of them soon. So I offer you those reflections and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and um, I think you've set the tone wonderfully for what is to follow and given us lots to think about. I'd like to introduce you now to Wanta Jumba Jumba Patrick, an outstanding theologian in his own right, but also a Walpuri elder and director of the Milpuri Festival in Lajamanu. Wanta joins us from Lajamanu, where uh, the community was put into a lockdown about a week ago and uh, scuttled our travel plans and internet links and everything like that. But we, we're really glad to welcome you here today, Wanta. Um, Wanta has led numerous research projects on Walpuri songs, epistemology, education, the repatriation of archival records and youth engagement. He's provided policy advice on Indigenous law, education and youth matters to government and industry bodies, including the Australian government's Indigenous Voice National Co-Design Group. Wanta, uh, before we begin, I'm going to play a short video in a second, but um, it was your idea to shape this symposium around the theme of Wangkari Kari, and we're going to watch something about that soon, but perhaps you could introduce this by telling us what was it about Wangkari Kari that you thought was a good story to begin with our discussions today? Well, um... One dietary is ceremony. Like I said, one dairy, there's one dairy. 
It's my name, it's my mother's ceremony, my mother's clan group ceremony, sorry. And um, yeah, there's near, near Lake Mikai, all those countries there. Um, the Walburys are called Ngalia, that, that area. And I'm better both, I'm Ngalia and Wanaka, the northern east Walburi group on my father's side. But um, Wondari Dari, yeah, like, like I told you about the, the great kangaroo, well, not yet, but <laughs> um, the word meaning gif, like the, I forgot the fellow name just before me. Yeah. Peter. Peter, yeah, like Peter said, it's all a gif. Wonder it means gif. And that's my name. But because um, I, I got friends who I grew up with, they call me Wanda. Mm -hmm. Means the son. Now, Wanda is a, is a girl's name, like Sally or Ruth or, or Bronwyn or something, or Beyonce, I don't know. Yeah, it's a girl's name. So they, they would tend to tease me. Yeah, it, it's, it, that humor is still with us too. But I like it. I'm, uh, I like to be called short, Wanda. Wanda, I want to introduce Wanda. The word Wanda is a um, gift. Wanda, the ceremony means the gift road. It's a, it's a ceremony of a trading route. A trading route is, um, yeah, like I said, that history is near Nidri. Yeah, the Emu men gathered people from the East Coast, gathered people on the West Coast. Yeah, and by the person. Yeah, that means Wandari Dari is a trading route. But it's also, um, a kangaroo. So this is a hymn's teaching about the kangaroo. Or well, maybe later I'll tell you about the kangaroo, he'll teach you about one Yeah. Um, I will start with the hymn you could send from the hymn skin group. Yeah, then and and I can show you some images here. Yeah, everyone's familiar with this one. If you can see it, yeah. No. A little bit higher there, won't it? No. Yeah. That's the coat of arms. Yes. <laughs> coat of arms. Now, I don't know how it ended up there, but if they made connection to my people, that's actually the, the, the Kuriki ceremony, the Nisian ceremony. Some of us went through, I was in that too. Yeah, and, and I will teach this. Hmm. Excuse me for my drawing, but what is that? It's a little kangaroo. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's little, maybe it's big. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a wheel, wheel or big nice, Yo. but it's both. Yeah, but you know, I will explain that later. But we call it the digest system. The one that you tell you is also a digest system. Now you will have to ask each other a question, whose digest system is that? Yeah. You might talk about, about things earlier. I was talking about how you feed on knowledge. That's a, Emu's name. I'm about to eat. I'm about to dig it up. I'm about to um, understand things about my knowledge. Yeah, Yankiri, Kananda, Kalea. Three main names for the Emu. They're the coat of arms. No, it's nothing to do with going, the two animals going backwards. <laughs> now to us, it's all symbolized what is identity for this country. Yeah, the two stick there and the bottom there, the two trees, we call it witty. Witty ceremony is in that Kuriki, the initiation ceremony. The kangaroo is a initiation ceremony too. This, the middle of the shield there is um, Southern Cross. 
and the Emmy, of course, and the big circle is the Kuriki, the shield. Now, all of them is in the back. To me, one of you see that, that's my initiation ceremony, war free one. One directory, it was given to me, given to me by my uncle. Yeah, he, he suggested that we put it in the military. Yeah. Well, we dance. I can't dance, I'm just what, what, what you know, would call a jungai. And I would call in what we call means guardian. Yeah. So I'll, I'll only direct that dance, but I can't dance in it. I'll sing it, but I can't, I can't dance it. It belongs to the East Mob and the West Mob. You know, this, the, People in military, you've seen them in, in the colors. Yeah, one's a green group, one's a blue group, one's a red group, and one's a, a what? green group, yellow group, red group, blue group. Yeah. The blue one is the immune. That element is water. I'm talking about the Southern Cross again, where mm -hmm. people even be represented by fire. Yeah, the government of the earth. The um, wind is um, the red mob, the kangaroo mob. And of course, the last one is the fire. Uh, yeah, they say fire twice. <laughs> no, the east mob is the earth. And the fire is the, the west end mob. The yellow ones. Yeah. They're all the season too. So you, you know where the summer belongs to. You know the wet season belongs. To. You know the dry season belongs. To. You know the after the wet. Waika season belongs to. So yeah, all these layers of all these in group being represented in all those things, especially on the southern coast. Um one day, day, Teach all that one. Mm. Yeah, we are to trade. We are to trade almost everything to each other, and that's given this country identity. I mean, it's given it to us to identify with this country. I can't understand why someone would come and try and why that. Even the coat of arms wiped that one off, with just replacing it with the delivery story or the handshake story, all that, you know, war gives birth to a nation, <laughs> so to speak. That, that's what they say. That's what the Western world say. But to us, no. We didn't build it on war, we built it on trading. We, we didn't clean each other out, no. We respected each other. That's how much Wandari Dari is celebrated throughout Central Australia. Mm -hmm. Everyone so, coming together, everyone passing on things to each other, even families, marriage, all that one. Yeah. Just like we come to, to the um, Winbarko, it's called a mountain in east of Papanya, Winbarko. I'm happy to even call it my own, my people's Mount Sinai. <laughs> yeah, you know that that all that connection, and it just bring you know smile to any any young people if I carry a yapa or or old people or young people because I'm. Um, but like I said, that story is for next time. But remember, that crossing over from the East Coast to the North, uh, sorry, to the West Coast, the West Coast to the East Coast, that's one dare dare, the ultimate trading route, the ultimate digest system. I'll show you why. Yeah, if you can see that, kangaroo. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's upside down. 
it's upside down, but that's okay. That's the point. Um, maybe it's not upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. I'm just going to draw something beside it. Give me a minute. Sorry, I got no. Um, Maybe it's upside down now. Yo. Put the shape of that. That's Australia. Yes. You can see you from the mouth, mm. from the mouth to the stomach, to the um, bottle, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit of a, but that, it's in the song line. But the digest, digest system of this country is the trade trading room. The veins are the, are the trading rules. So you can see why we cook kangaroo and it's very sacred. Yeah. When we cut the kangaroo, we put it, we cut it on the right side of the stomach. We clean it stomach and all that, we chuck away most of them, but we don't chuck away the intestine. Yeah, that's for sealing up the whole back. The most important part is, yeah, you get the bladder, you chuck that away, but you get another little urine, I think you call it, pile or pile or something. You get that on really carefully. Yeah, make sure you don't spill them on the kangaroo. Mm. But it's not good for the meat. So you put it on each side of it. You put it on the bottom, and you put them on the Yeah, you tip the little urine in that spot there, that spot there, that spot there, that spot there. That means you've done a good job. Most old people will see that and see that you're not, you're not a problem. But once you do it the wrong way, yeah, you'll be outcast in what we know. In some, some tribe, you're, um, yeah, it would be tragic. Yeah. There's really but, important yeah. rules around um, cutting up the kangaroo and distributing it to the right um, family networks and, and different family isn't there and that's um, it yeah. it's it, it's a highly responsible role but the idea I want is that um everyone is nourished by by the law and, and the wisdom that comes from learning With how it. to cook the kangaroo right yeah that's it that's uh you in good hands so yeah if you do it wrong then not yeah you would be a bad hand for everyone even our own family so that disconnect you from you know in what we look they they have cast you till you learn it and you'll be you'll come back by getting um small wedge tail feathers you know this what the down i think you call them yeah. the small feather you gather that on and bring it to the old world as a gift give it to them and they'll accept you back so so one tari tari is really about relationships right across the different groups and, and how we look after one another. Is that right? That's it. It's you look after each other, but mostly look after country. It's your mora and look after your mora by looking after country. Mm. And, and coming back to the shield. Sorry, you go, one. Yeah. yeah, the shield. I mean, I'll finish off with the one day. Yeah, yeah you can see it's, it's Australia. You might see where the mouth is. Oh, it's back to front. <laughs> you might see what that way. Yeah, that's Queensland over there. That's Western Australia down there. And there's the middle there. The mouth is somewhere around the East Coast. The stomach is the center. I talked earlier about the two stomachs. And the anus is at the Western Australia. 
and that's near Purun, where the emu had exited from this country and trying to swim out of the country for his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling everybody not to underestimate the, the um, song lines. Yeah. Yeah, it talks about the history of yourself. Yeah. So and coming back to the coat of arms and Australia as an identity, you're encouraging yes. us to understand our identity as Australians through the kangaroo, through the emu, through one taritari, which yes. can use and uh, nourishes our understanding of what it means to be Australian. Yeah, so it's a gift to all of us. Yeah, it's a gift. Like Peter said, it's a gift. Mm. Yeah, that's it. It's, we are to look after the country. We are gift to it, and it is a gift to us. So identity, we mustn't try and put something else there. We we'll keep the original identity. Yeah, you can learn it from indigenous people all over. Yeah, the mother's sky, the father, the mother's earth. Yeah, they travel all over, making sure their children are okay in the dream time before they were killed by the same thing that was hunting the emu. Yeah. So that, that's it, the, the whole story and connection to it. Yeah, we didn't put it there. Yeah. I'll leave it to your imagination who put it there in the first place for my Oyagara, for my ancestors. Mm. That's, that's wonderful, Wanta. Um, maybe just to finish up, maybe we could bring it back to the Kurichi, the, the shield, and the importance of, of what that teaches us how to listen. And from the Milky Way that stretches right across from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, we also have, have the shield that one places on one's head uh, when, when you come to listen to another group. Um, do you want to maybe conclude bringing it back to the... Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, uh, the shield, because it's an initiation called Kuriji, which means the shield, yeah, we are to protect our own Murakuru, the ceremony, the language, the skin name, and the law. Yeah, we are guardian to it. The two trees that in, in the bottom, that's with it. It talks about a negative consequences and the positive consequences. Yeah. And then the emu is a teacher. You can see it in real life. An emu father will hatch the egg and take, teach the chick to grow up and take him all around. The mother only lays the eggs and disappears again. And the kangaroo. What well, do you see the kangaroo? Yeah. We, we hatch talking on it. We're walking on it. That's a kangaroo. The whole continent is a kangaroo. The ultimate kangaroo and the sky is the ultimate king. Kind of. That's our that's our roof and our and our floor and all four winds are the four walls of our of our mora, our home. And so maybe just to conclude, I I believe there's a proverb that holds all this together. Um, about the homeland of the kangaroo, and, and, and maybe we might say that uh, we need to learn to listen to this proverb, but also learn to listen to the author of this proverb in, in your words. Um, perhaps that's we it. can conclude with that, that little saying. Yeah, that's it. Um, the, the, um, no, the living up the home, in the homeland of the kangaroo? Mm. Yeah, yeah. In Walpuri or both? Yeah, of course, Walpuri. Okay. Muranga Pujal Penina Nambula, Wawere Glamula, Maninangalo, Kananganjawi, Yung and Bapunari Mandi, Firebar in Japo, Walla Urubia. To live in the homeland of the kangaroo, we have to understand the immune. We will teach it to soar like the West Bank. Yeah.
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Wanta. You've given us um, plenty of food for thought for both our stomachs. <laughs> and um, we, we're going to, there'll be chances to answer some more questions with some question and answer at the end of this session. But before we move there, we're going to hear from one more speaker uh, today. Um, I'd like to introduce Reverend Glenn Loffrey. Uh, Glenn is a Wiradjuri man, an artist and a writer and an Anglican priest. He's presently the vicar at St Oswald's Anglican Church and has, has recently been inducted as the Canon of St Paul's. Um, Glenn is an artist and a writer with three books to his name. And the latest is titled On Being Blackfella's Young Fella, Is Being Aboriginal Enough? Glenn was the finalist in the Moran Portrait Prize in 2018, and more recently in the Mandola, Blake and Paddington Art Prizes. Glenn, I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit more about your art, some of the stories you might want to weave from there. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Sam. And it's um, quite daunting to follow on from Wanta, and I thank him very much for um, what he's shared today. Uh, I was shared with Wanta on a, 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 a seminar uh, two days ago. And as I said to, to in that seminar, I'm, um, I don't have an understanding or the capacity to talk about ceremony or tradition in the way that he and others do. But I learned so much from sitting and listening to them. And it's been very, uh, a powerful opening up of who I am. I, I guess before I talk about my art, um, I grew up in a family that meant that I didn't identify uh, as Wiradjuri. None of our family identified and many of my family still don't. But we grew up in a place that where 100% um, of the local Aboriginal tribe had been uh, wiped out by 1876. So, and I went back there a couple of weeks ago and on the lawns of the Anglican church, they were celebrating 200 years of European settlement. So it was very disturbing to be able to watch and to feel that you didn't exist and you still don't exist in those places. And yet country is vitally important to me and to my art. I grew up on country with my father and we would walk everywhere together. While it was a farm, we didn't have utilities or motorbikes, two and a half thousand acres, we walked on our feet and we listened to country. My father would make the statement all the time. If you listen to country, it will tell you what you need to do and it will tell you what it wants from you, how to be on that place in that space. And he always added, and above all else, don't make dust. Don't be in a hurry to learn. Don't be in a hurry to go places or to be somewhere else. And I guess that's been very important for me as I've come to grips with who I am as a person and has allowed the country that lives within me to speak out, to come out, to, to educate me on the way through. Um, by virtue of the fact that I do not have permission to tell story from traditional point of view, I avoid where possible anything that may seem to look like that. But what I do do is refer to my canvas as a means to, to being on country. The other thing about my country, my specific space where I come from, it's been dug up by three massive open cut coal mines. So not only has my Aboriginal heritage and many of the sacred sites and icons have been destroyed, but so did the settler population. There is no evidence of the settler population that was there when I grew up at this time. It's all been destroyed by coal mines. 
So I can't walk across my country in the way that I used to. So what I do with my art is use my art as a means to, to walk country. I see my canvas as my country and I want to have a dialogue or a conversation and to listen to the stories that are hidden within country. Um, when I first started painting, um, my art was probably more about my anger and my frustration at what had happened to our country. This painting is called COVID-1770, what happened when Cook sneezed. And it refers to the fact that our country was taken over by a pandemic that we've only just learned to live with and we haven't actually got rid of. It's the boat people who came here and settled on us. Um, we would like them to leave and go away so that our country could heal itself. So it's a way of looking at that whole sense of the settlement of Australia, which is a very nice word for invasion. Um, and it doesn't actually speak to the truth of what happened. But as I've got a little bit further down the line, my art has started to really speak about country, about the patterns and the stories that are kept the lost within what we, where we are. I paint with a small stick. Everything is painted with a stick. Some people call it dots and lines, but it's really just marks on a piece of white canvas. And what I look for is what are the patterns that are beginning to appear inside the painting that I'm painting. My palette, as you can see, and you'll notice over the, the next few paintings, is this very much about water, it's about land, and it's about sky. If you look closely to this painting, you will see there's a little clown here. He's got a little red string he's trying to wind up, looking for reconciliation and peace. There is the cross. Here there is a soldier at the foot of the cross. Here is the boat that brought the invaders and the slaves and the convicts. Down here you have mother giving birth. Uh, and then you have a child coming to grow. These are all images, not that I actually set up to paint them but that begin to appear as I walk across this space, giving it permission to tell me its story. And here in the sky are three wedge tails. Or are they the Trinity? It depends from where we look. So what I'm after, and then at the end of the painting, as you'll see, there's white space right down here. That's those stories from the dreaming that we still have yet to learn, those places we've still yet to discover, the transcendent that's beyond all that we know in this space. There's no preference in here given to one point of view. Up here we have the koala. On this side we have the kookaburra, all sitting in a tree. It's all about the various things that speak to us as part of our country. This one speaks to us again, paint, this was painted at, on the edge of the Barker River and Barkinji country, uh, and their elders who I acknowledge. And this is the story of, of, the, of the Darling River or the Barker at Kenya. And it talks about the uh, water that sits under the surface beside the river. This is a healthy river, healthy country. I painted this when I was at the Barker when there was no water and it wasn't healthy. Country wasn't healthy, people weren't healthy. Once water is there, the importance of water means, and throughout this painting, you'll see white man footprints. I always paint the white man with a pair of boots aboriginal people with toes um, and there's the footprints sitting on top of that and they appear all the way throughout this painting 
But as I painted this painting, various things came into being, including a long neck turtle, which you can't see very well on this image, but it's in there. It sits in here. There are a whole lot of other images of trees and forests, of people sitting on a country, and there is the goanna, the emu, the kangaroo, and also here, this space that is beyond. There is more to country than what we see, feel, or touch. Here is a set of three paintings, three very large paintings, which pick up the images of country from the center to the sea. And again, we have the beyond. We have the dolphins. There are a whole range of peoples hidden inside those paintings, which will tell you the story. There's the eagle sun, the river, meeting places, story places, all within that one painting. You will find that in here, if you look closely enough, images, images from both sides of my ways of seeing. I was brought up on the Blue Mount, on the top of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales. And when I stood on top of the Great Dividing Range, I was able to see both ways. The water that grew, came down on top of the mountain ran both ways. And it's helped me to understand that part of my journey is how do I look and see and relate to the both ways of my life to the Western Christian, to the Aboriginal. How do I find ways to look at both of those, not preferencing one necessarily over the other, but making the discussion, the dialogue, so that I begin to understand both. I suspect um, in part of my life that has caused me to but for much of my life, I wanted to assimilate. I wanted to be white. It was what my family wanted for all of us. And I guess becoming an Anglican priest was the whitest thing a, an Aboriginal could do. Now I'm moving back the other way and wanting to take what is my Aboriginality and to pull apart what I believe as a Christian through the eyes of what I'm learning about being Aboriginal, what is within me, and how do I repackage the traditional understanding of Christianity through the eyes, as Wanta was talking about before, through the way that we see the stories. The final painting is an elephant on country. This is painted for the fact of global, for the climate change, but it's more than that. If you look closely, there's a little elephant sitting just there. There's a little elephant sitting just there in the painting. Now I didn't put him there. I started on this side of the painting. I did the brown on the bottom. Uh, and then I put the start of the green and then he just popped up. I looked at him and said, wow, there's an elephant on country. What is an elephant doing on country? One of my first memories as a three-year-old child was the, the circus train, which went about 40 meters past the back of our house, stopping to allow my brother and I to get close to and see the elephant that was on the back of the circus train at the time. But it's also the elephant in, on country about land use, caring for land, caring for country, of how we ignore one whole set of knowledge and understanding and replace it with technology and Western thinking, that we don't understand the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the practices of the people who are here first. 
In this painting, you have mother and child. You have Jesus on the cross just here. You have people standing beside the cross. You have the mountain, which could be the mount for the ascension. You have a female figure there. Through the sky are so many other images. Again, these are images that come out of the canvas. As I follow and just do with my little piece of stick, all of those dots. I use a stick because you can't put much paint on the canvas with a stick. So it takes a long time. This painting, which is 30 by 24, 30 by 24, took over a month just to create and to sit and to, to work through. It's a conversation with country, it's listening to country and it's allowing country to tell story. It changes my theology dramatically. Um, I understand Jesus as my elder. I understand Jesus as a man of two countries, his mothers and his fathers. And he lives to the tradition and knowledge and language of both faithful to them that you know it's his faithfulness to the tradition that we need to, to the tradition of both places that we need to follow we need to be faithful to our traditions and in my case faithful to both of our tradition my, my traditions so it's a very it has changed how i see and understand being a christian suspect that's all i have to say Thanks very much, Glenn. I um, there's a lot there to to think about, and and um, I think the idea of attending to the world around us, to to listen and allow new connections and uh, creativity to emerge from that is is indeed a very interesting one, and I'd like to hear more about how that relates to your theology too. Um, we're going to uh, have a open out for some more discussion now. And I'm sure many of you have uh, questions that you might like to put to our panelists. Please do so in the Q&A function and uh, we'll just uh, keep an eye on them and, and maybe combine a few at once.